Right. So this lecture covers the basics of the senses of Holy Scripture and will serve as something of an introduction to what I hope will be a series of lectures on the topic, which I'm calling Master of the Sacred Page, Senses of Holy Scripture in Theology and Tradition. And just to give you a quick overview of what we'll be covering in this lecture, we'll look very briefly at what this doctrine is and why it's important. And then we'll spend the vast majority of our time considering the actual contents of this doctrine, the real divisions of the senses, what they are, how we define them, some examples, and so on. And then we will have a brief conclusion reflecting on the usage of this doctrine in theology, as well as the need we have to habituate its elements in our mind so that we can actually interpret Holy Scripture well. So with that in mind, we can begin with some words of introduction. Understanding and understanding well the sense proper to Holy Scripture is among the tasks of every theologian, uh, even among his initial tasks. The doctrine properly understood is an underling to theological science. It is preparatory for the theological project, or it belongs to that arena often called prolegomena, which is why Thomas Aquinas considers it immediately in question one of his Summa, where he handles what sacred doctrine is, what is its range or subject matter, and other things of that sort. That is to say, before theological science can even get off the ground, we have to apprehend firmly, be intimately familiar with, and thoroughly adept at both whether these senses are and also what they are. And not only under understanding this doctrine in the abstract, so to speak, but also in how it actually works in the concrete of Catholic interpretation. Insofar as soccer doctrina or supernatural theology has supernatural revelation as its principle or point of departure, and insofar as that supernatural revelation is chiefly contained in Holy Scripture, the doctrine of the senses stands in between the proximate source on the one hand of our theological knowledge, and then the actual knowledge we do derive and develop in the process of theological work. In Holy Scripture, no matter how far we develop our theology, and no matter how many other supernatural authorities we use as proximate authorities for supernatural truth, always lies at the bottom, the bottom of all of the knowledge we have developed, and at the bottom of all other supernatural authorities, like the church, the fathers, the doctors, and so on. And even when we speak of our initial encounter with Holy Scripture, as we face up to it and begin to draw water from the well of Holy Scripture, the doctrine of its senses becomes the pattern and guide for that encounter marks out its lines, and gives us the rules for proper engagement. This is why Thomas Aquinas not only considers this issue in question one of his Summa, but also considers it as the very last article immediately before he enters upon the proper object of theological inquiry, God and all of God. So the doctrine, simply put, is fundamental to the theological task and maximally useful and even essential to understand. The Catholic theologian, as Domingo Banez says, is simply one highly skilled in divine realities. And his calling is only seeing and speaking about God and all other realities insofar as they are from God and tend to him. Needless to say, Holy Scripture, as it bequeaths its sense to us, is maximally useful for becoming skilled in divine things and for executing that calling of seeing and speaking of God. For this reason, among others, understanding these senses is maximally useful and even essential for the theologian, 
and preparatory for his work. This leads us to ask the question, though, what actually is the doctrine of the sense proper to Holy Scripture? What is this doctrine? Well, as in all situations of this sort, we define by considering the proper object of our current inquiry, which we sometimes call the subject matter. Thomas Aquinas, for example, considers this question in ST1 Q1 A7 when he asks what the subject matter or the proper object of theology as a whole is, God and all of God. Similarly here, as we turn to ask what is this doctrine we are about to undertake an inquiry of, we need to determine as best we can, the proper object of our focus to center us and to give us a unity to uh, the understanding that we want to derive. And considering this, the doctrine of the sense proper to Holy Scripture is nothing else except the adequate explanation of how this name sense is in Holy Scripture in its global range, just as, for example, we might say that the doctrine of God's knowledge is our adequate explanation of how this name knowledge is in God. Again, referring to Thomas Aquinas, if you want to understand the doctrine of God's knowledge and what that doctrine is, you can see it's not only about defining what knowledge is, but also how knowledge is in God and all of the various ways and uh, many questions that we need to uh, handle in that topic in a similar way here with the doctrine of the senses of Holy Scripture. The doctrine, in short, is our explanation of how sense has a global range over that thing we call Holy Scripture, a global range which we adequately divide up into its proper categories. So this doctrine has as its proper object the actual sense proper to Holy Scripture, as distinct from sense proper to all other writings. Here, under this topic, we don't consider sense in letters, generally speaking, nor in those letters proper to the natural order, but only in those letters proper to the supernatural order, which are called together Holy Scripture. These letters, of course, are called holy. We speak of sacra literae. Their page is called holy, sacra pagina. And the scripture or writing as a whole is called holy, sacra scriptura, just as Christian doctrine or the teaching derived therefrom is called holy, sacra doctrina. Because this name holy itself says that something is distinguished from all others. Something is distinguished from from all others. Here, in our case, from all other letters, all other pages, all other writings, and all other teachings. That Holy Scripture is indeed holy is because it pertains to that revelation usually called supernatural. And because this supernatural revelation is chiefly contained in Holy Scripture, even somehow distinct from all other writings proper to the supernatural order itself, like those of the church, the fathers and the doctrines, uh, the fathers and the doctors. Hence, for this reason, its letters too are called holy, and their sense is called holy, that is to say, distinguished from sense proper to all other letters and all other writings. And so, as we turn to consider this doctrine, we have to consider that sense proper to Holy Scripture in a concordant way. It is to say, as distinguished from all else. As Thomas will note, in a quotation we will consider in a moment, sense in Holy Scripture is special or unique from all other writings, simply because the author of Scripture is God himself. All other doctrines handled by men are one thing. This doctrine here, handed down from God, is otherwise and has to be considered similarly otherwise. So really then, the doctrine of the senses is an extension 
of the doctrine of what Holy Scripture is as holy. Nevertheless, this doctrine still expropriates from what sense is as proper to other writings in the natural order, just like faith uses things of reason as its handmaiden. In theology, as always, so here we expropriate both what sense is, how sense is said to be in letter, what signification is, how letters and somehow realities themselves signify, yes, even what letters or words actually are, and many other issues like this are all expropriated by analogy of proper proportionality, so that we can then turn and explain that sense proper to Holy Scripture. These are all things that we know from the natural order, demonstrate and define from the natural order, and to be blunt, we fight about from within the natural order, what we can call the domain of philosophy for now. And here, for our purposes, as we begin to come to grips with this doctrine of Christian teaching, the philosophical explanations of all these things are flatly Aristotelian. For example, as he covers them in his famous De Interpretatione, it's so important for the Latin West tradition and also the tradition of later fathers and medieval doctors, considering what the senses of Holy Scripture are and the tradition of Catholic interpretation and things of this sort are all an expropriation of Aristotelian reflection of these things in the natural order brought now into the supernatural order mutatis mutandis. And so for our purposes, the philosophical explanations we are resting upon, relying upon our Aristotelian, as it was for the fathers, medievals, broadly speaking, and especially as championed by Thomas himself. The doctrine, though, is or also strives to be an adequate explanation an adequate explanation. This is because it determines or tries to determine how sense is in Holy Scripture in a similar way to how Aristotle's 10 categories, quantity, quality, and others of that sort, are in ens creatum, or created being, as its proper categories. For example, as we will consider throughout the remainder of this lecture, and beginning more thoroughly in a moment, Sense in Holy Scripture is said to be twofold because this adequate division reflects the fact that in Holy Scripture, not only words, but even realities themselves also signify by words, themselves also signify whence sense is taken. Two, the literal sense taken from literal signification is said to be twofold because this adequate division reflects the fact that in Holy Scripture, not only proper, but even improper signification is found. Again, from both of these, we take sense. Spiritual sense taken from spiritual signification is said to be threefold, because this, for various reasons, adequately divides spiritual sense. Once again, this is similar to how Aristotle's 10 categories, like substance, quantity, quality, and others, adequately divide ens creatum, and so are used to define all that falls therein. And uh, this is a concept that we'll talk about much more in lectures to come, but it's central to the task of, of theology to always be giving an adequate explanation of whatever proper object we're considering. And one of the great things about Thomas Aquinas to use an example is how adequate he has uh, divided the sense of Holy Scripture for us. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're following his pattern here. So in this lecture, then, uh, continuing on with these initial points in mind, these generalities of what this doctrine is, how it expropriates from the order of nature, and also how it strives to be adequate, we want to give some brief introduction to the doctrine, which can serve us as an initial foundation to build upon in many lectures to come. Basic aspects of this doctrine. Following proper order, 
one always considers first whether something is, and then second, what it is. Nevertheless, for pedagogical purposes here, we're going to first consider what are the basics of this doctrine. Later, we'll revert to demonstrating that these senses are in Holy Scripture, and then more fully explain what they are. Uh, we will actually spend quite a lot of time demonstrating that these senses are indeed in Holy Scripture, especially the spiritual senses. Uh, that the literal senses are in Holy Scripture is not so much a thing contested today, but uh, the spiritual senses have been contested for the last many centuries. And so we'll take many lectures, in fact, demonstrating in various ways, proving that these senses indeed are found therein. And then we will take a large number of, uh, of weeks, lectures, explaining more fully what they are. Here, we want to just give the basics and uh, cover the, uh, the bases here and uh, then work from there. What then are the basics of this doctrine? Well, Thomas Aquinas covers this in various places, but for our purposes here, one in particular stands out, and that's his Galatians 4 commentary. There, while he gives the sense of Galatians 4, Thomas summarizes the doctrine as a whole. And he's prompted to do so, not only because of the difficulty of the letter Galatians 4, where we find many senses, both literal and spiritual, but also by the Apostle Paul's claim that spiritual sense is found in the Old Testament scriptures which Paul gives when he says that those things were then being spoken, quote, through allegory, where one is given leading to another. Allegory is an equivocal name, not only in Paul's time, but also and even more so for Thomas's. And this gives Thomas an occasion to give the sense of allegory as Paul intended here. And in the process, gives Thomas the opportunity to explain the basics of this doctrine as a whole. Here, then, is what every theologian has to know when he intends to interpret any letter of Holy Scripture, especially the more difficult letters, such as Galatians 4. And here I'm going to quote from Thomas, uh, a rather lengthy quote. I'll supply it for you, but uh, I feel it's good to read it in full. A couple paragraphs from Thomas, quote, there is twofold signification. One is in words. The other is in realities which words signify. Now, this twofold signification is in Holy Scripture in a special way, and such is not in other writings because the author of Holy Scripture is God, in whose power it is that he accommodates not only words to designate realities, which even a man can do, but even realities themselves to designate realities. And thus, in other sciences handled by men, sciences which cannot be accommodated for signifying except words only, therein only words signify. But this is proper or unique to this divine science. Namely, that words and even the very realities themselves signified through the words signify something. And thus, this science can have many senses. For the signification where words signify something pertains to the literal or historical sense, whereas the signification where realities signified in words themselves signify still other realities pertains to the mystical or spiritual sense. On the one hand, this is still Thomas, concerning this literal sense, something can be signified in a twofold way. One, according to the propriety of locution, such as when I say that a man laughs, or according to similitude or metaphor, such as when I say that a field laughs or a meadow laughs. And we use each way in Holy Scripture, such as when we say in the first way that Jesus ascends, and when we say in the second way that Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Thus, the parabolic or metaphorical sense is also included under the literal sense. 
On the other hand, though, the mystical or spiritual sense is divided into three. For first, the old law is a figure of the new law, just as the Apostle Paul says. And thus, insofar as those realities which are of the old law signify those realities which are of the new, there is allegorical sense. Further, the new law is a figure of future glory, according to Dionysius in his celestial hierarchies. And thus, Insofar as these realities which are in the new law and in Christ signify those realities which are in the fatherland, there is anagogical sense. Further, third, in the new law, these realities which are conducted in the head, namely Christ, are examples of those things we ought to do, because whatsoever things have been written were written for our learning. And thus, insofar as those realities which in the new law have been done to Christ, and in those realities which signify Christ, we have signs of those realities which we ought to do, there is third moral sense. For all these, here is a clear example. Thomas continues, for with all these which I say, let there be light, that is to say, ad literum of bodily light, it pertains to the literal sense. But if let there be light, that is, Christ is born in the church, is understood, then it pertains to the allegorical sense. But if let there be light, that is, we are introduced through Christ to glory, is said, then it pertains to the anagogical sense. But if let there be light, i.e. we are illumined and inflamed through Christ in our intellect and in our affection is understood, then it pertains to the moral sense, end quote. A lengthy quote, but one in which Thomas gives the entirety of the doctrine of the senses of Holy Scripture. And we want to spend the next Oh, hour, hour or so considering this and uh, explaining what Thomas is saying here so that we can further understand the basics of this doctrine. So what is Thomas saying here? Well, in creatures, with us and among creatures, he says, we find two modes of conventional signification. This is something that Augustine and many others have taught after considering the natural order. One kind is when words signify, when words signify. For example, when I'm pointing to a tree and say that this is a tree, then this name tree signifies that reality there with leaves and a trunk. Words themselves signify. But another kind of signification is when realities themselves signify, when things or realities signify. And this is divided typically into two kinds, natural and conventional. Here, we're not speaking of how realities signify naturally, like smoke naturally signifies fire because fire causes smoke. Rather, we're speaking of how realities signify conventionally. For example, when a certain road sign conventionally signifies that we must stop. Furthermore, we're speaking of conventional signification, not which is unfittingly made, but which is fittingly made. Not which is unfittingly made, but which is fittingly made. For example, when the certain road sign is painted red, because with us and among creatures, things which suffer evil often manifest redness. For this reason, the road sign, because it's painted red, has been fittingly made significant because it signifies that we must stop in a similar to way to how we must stop when we're approaching 
some evil. These certain fittingly made significant realities are going to be always somehow similar to their signified realities. These certain fittingly made significant realities are always going to be somewhat similar to the things they signify. And in fact, their signification itself is going to run along the lines of their real similitude. And for this reason, we say that their signification is rational. So the sign is painted red, and redness itself is somewhat similar to what the sign intends to signify, namely that harm will come about if we don't obey the command. And for this reason, the signification of this red road sign runs parallel to the line of similarity of redness to the actual thing that it's signifying. This is very important, something we'll consider much more fully in lectures down the road, but uh, nonetheless is important to flag here. We're considering conventional signs, conventional real signs, rather than natural, but specifically conventional signs which are fittingly made such that their signification is rational or intellectual. Nevertheless, even though the similitude in signs of this sort runs along the same lines as their signification itself, it is not the similitude, but rather the signification itself which makes them signs. And even if one knows, for example, that red is similar to danger, one doesn't yet know that it actually signifies we must stop unless you know that it is a sign to stop. And even, again, further, if one does indeed stop because he suspects danger, given the natural similarity of redness to danger, nonetheless, you've not actually apprehended the sign or the sense in the sign or had revealed to yourself the intention of the speaker or maker of the sign unless you know to stop because of the signification, not only because of the similitude. These are some of the basics of signification and sense in the natural order that we, again, refine and determine and define philosophically before we come to theology. But nonetheless, as we approach the doctrine of the senses of Holy Scripture, we have to review and keep in mind and continually revert to in order to expropriate from this natural order and these things in order to do theology. So similarly to what we find in the natural order, as we've just given some gestures to, and again, we'll expound this much more fully in lectures to come. Similarly to that, we have uh, in Duenas, in theology, we find something similar, Thomas says, because in Holy Scripture, wherein God himself is speaking and God himself has made literal signs and where God himself has enclosed race signs or signs which are realities or things, he has enclosed these race signs made elsewhere by him, whereupon everything that follows in this doctrine is proper or unique to Holy Scripture alone, we find in Holy Scripture both written words signify and even realities themselves signify as well. We find in Holy Scripture written words signify, like these words, in the beginning, and also that sometimes realities also signified by the words and so enclosed in Holy Scripture themselves also signify. For example, the reality of Christ himself pouring water in the bowl 
in the Gospel of John, talked about in the letters of John 13, this reality of Christ himself pouring water into the bowl is itself a certain sign, just as Christ says in John 13, 16, namely that he does this as a certain sign. So in Holy Scripture, words or letters signify and things or realities also signify by these words themselves also signify. We have two levels here. Both are enclosed within Holy Scripture. Both words and things or realities signify. Now, the sense that's taken from signification in words or in letters is what we call literal sense. The sense taken from the signification in words or in letters, we call literal sense. Literal here is said from litera, the Latin for letters, in contrast to race or things, realities, just like we talked about above, both letters signify and things or realities signify. And so we call this literal sense because it is the signification we take from letters or words and not from things. In other words, we don't call it literal in contrast to metaphorical, for example, as we use the word literal today in common English discourse. These are equivocal terms. Literal sense is not contrasted to metaphorical. It's in contrast to sense coming from things. So we call it literal sense, but in the tradition, it's also often called historical sense, probably for two reasons, one of two reasons. Either one, because in Holy Scripture, history and its facts, so to speak, is a very frequent and principal or key example of literal sense. Or perhaps two, because in Holy Scripture, historical facts or happenings, we call them the race gesta in Latin, the happenings. Uh, in Holy Scripture, often these historical facts or happenings, most especially the great deeds and doings of God, are, again, the most frequent examples of signifying realities, whereupon the sense taken from the letters which signify these realities is called historical in contrast to spiritual. So in the tradition, we often call the literal sense historical, either one, because history is a frequent example of the literal sense, or two, because it's those historical facts or the great deeds and doings of God, which are perhaps the most frequent examples of the spiritual sense, these signifying realities over here. Whereas, on the other hand, the sense we take from the signification in realities, themselves signified by words, we call spiritual sense. So literal sense, sometimes called historical sense, Sense taken from signification realities is called spiritual, spiritual sense. Nonetheless, in the tradition, spiritual sense goes by many, many names. And in fact, so many names that very frequently people become confused, uh, especially in historical treatments of this topic and a lot of the secondary literature. There is a massive, massive amount of confusion just because people don't understand how equivocal names are for this sense. What the sense is, is the sense taken from signifying in realities. We call this by many things. Normally, we call it spiritual sense, but nonetheless, in the tradition, it has many, many names. For example... It's called the metaphorical sense. It's called the allegorical sense. And the trouble is we often find these names used for other senses as well. And this is, again, why people get confused. 
But most frequently, besides calling it the spiritual sense, it's probably most frequently called the mystical, the mystical sense coming from mystery, as we find uh, in a very famous quote from Gregory, the letter of Holy Scripture, uh, it, when it talks about a history, reveals a mystery, mystical sense. Um, it's probably called the mystical sense, again, for two reasons. Uh, generally speaking, because it pertains to something unknown. Uh, and again, two reasons here. Number one, probably because the sense itself is unknown immediately and also remains altogether unknown, except when you first apprehend the literal sense. So one thing that's very, very important about the entire doctrine of the senses of Holy Scripture is that we never, never understand the mystical or spiritual sense except by way of the literal sense. And so in tradition, sometimes this sense that's spiritual is called mystical because we don't know it immediately. And it remains altogether unknown except by way of apprehending the literal sense. Or two, perhaps another reason, because the realities signified by these significant realities are the things of mystery, are the things of mystery, the Holy Trinity, Christ, grace, faith, charity, sacraments. So these two senses literal and spiritual, are what we call the twofold sense in Holy Scripture. The twofold sense in Holy Scripture. The literal, taken from signification in words or letters. The spiritual, taken from signification in realities or things. These two senses are the twofold sense in Holy Scripture. And in fact, very importantly, they are in relation to all other senses found in Holy Scripture. And there are many more. These twofold senses are to all these other, just as their genuses or their genera, just as their genuses. We reduce all the other senses of Holy Scripture to these two, which are the genuses or the foundational categories, we might say, for all the other many, many senses we find in Holy Scripture. And we define each one by signification and then the respective difference of either words or realities. So the definition of the literal sense, and you can write this down, it's very important. It needs to be very precise. Uh, one of the major controversies, for, for example, in the early modern period between Roman Catholics and Protestants happens because people don't define the literal and spiritual sense exactly and correctly. And so massive controversies emerge because they don't have exact definitions and therefore are talking past each other. So we define these two senses exactly in this way. Literal sense is defined as that sense taken from signification in letters. Spiritual sense is that signification taken from word, uh, realities, excuse me. Spiritual sense is that sense taken from signification in realities. These historically are the best definitions and the definitions that Thomas gives us. And so they are important to memorize and always have as your reference point whenever you are considering these issues. Something further here, which begins to get a little bit difficult, but nonetheless is important to understand. And that is this. Because literal sense is taken up from signification in letters 
And for this reason, its verification is proximately founded upon those letters. Hence, we say that the literal sense is in the letter, in the letter. Sometimes, especially in the Latin tradition, it is said to be under or sub litera, under the letter, in the letter. Because literal sense is taken from signification in letters, and therefore its verification or its truth-making is always proximately founded upon the letter itself, therefore we say it is in the letter. In the letter, there's much misunderstanding. In fact, one of the most fundamental misunderstandings about the doctrine of the senses of Holy Scripture is what it means for a sense to be in the letter or under the letter. Literal sense taken from signification in letters, and therefore its verification or truth-making is always proximately founded upon the letters itself. Therefore, we call, we say, literal sense is in the letter. And similarly, because spiritual sense, even though it's ultimately taken from signification in realities, nevertheless is proximately taken from the signification in letters because we only apprehend spiritual sense from the letters. For this reason, spiritual sense, in addition, is also said to be in the letter. Also said to be in the letter. Let me say this again, because it's so important. Spiritual sense, even though we take it from the signification proper to things, proper to realities, nonetheless, because we apprehend that signification and realities by way of the letters themselves, and therefore the letters always serve as the proximate verification or truth-making of spiritual sense. Therefore, we also say spiritual sense is in the letter, in the letter. And again, this is where people begin to get very confused about the doctrine of the twofold senses of Holy Scripture. They consider the spiritual sense and the literal sense, and how is this one in and also in, and they're all jumbled up and confused, and it's like this bumble, bundle of senses, like little spikes sticking, sticking out of the letter of Scripture, and everyone just doesn't know what's going on. They're not understanding what it means for a sense to be in a letter. Sense said to be in a letter because its verification is proximately founded upon that letter. Sense, whatever sense we're talking about, is said to be in the letter because its proximate foundation or its truth-making is always founded upon the letter itself. Now, because both these senses are said to be in the letter, as we've just determined what that means, because both these senses are in the letter, for this reason, we also say that twofold sense is in Holy Scripture. Twofold sense is in Holy Scripture. We also say that Holy Scripture has twofold sense. Never, ever, ever do we say that two senses are in Holy Scripture. We only say a twofold sense is in Scripture, not two senses. Twofold sense, not two senses. We don't say that two senses are in Holy Scripture because even though the verification of the spiritual sense is indeed proximately founded upon the letters, nonetheless, it's ultimately taken from the signification proper to the realities themselves. And for this reason, it's only actually in Holy Scripture, insofar as these realities themselves, which are significant outside and before Holy Scripture, <clears throat> 
have been enclosed in the text because they themselves are signified in its letters. They're enclosed in the text because they themselves are signified in its letters. So you have these realities, and they are significant or meaningful, roughly speaking, outside and before the text of Holy Scripture. And that signification and the sense that is generated therefrom becomes enclosed in the text insofar as these things are signified by the letters of the text themselves. So you have the letters, they point us to certain things, and those things also sometimes point us to other things, and therefore all of this is enclosed in the text of Holy Scripture together, stacked on top of each other, so to say. It's a very bad image, but nonetheless, it's more helpful than uh, trying to wade through the confusion of how this sense is in the text and this sense is in the text and they're like accidents in a subject and everyone gets confused. Many errors come from this. No, it's more like they're stacked in layers or something of that sort. Letters bring us to things, things bring us to other things. And therefore this whole stage, this whole stage is enclosed in the bosom of Holy Scripture and said to be therein. The reason why all of this has been enclosed in the text is because even though throughout human history, God has revealed in two ways, both through realities, especially his deeds in Israel and the actions and passions of Christ, and also through words, even though he's done it both ways, nonetheless, He's principally deposited this supernatural revelation into Holy Scripture itself, enclosing therein both the words of prophets and apostles and those realities which he intended not only to instruct the people present when they were happening, but also for the instruction of everyone future as their very own proper and living word of God. God, in his mercy, has enclosed both of these things such that we would have the living and present word of God with us throughout all of time. This is something which Thomas says is another layer of grace, another layer of grace. The fact that God has not only revealed himself in things, not only revealed himself in words for a moment of a prophet or a certain group of people on the plains of Sinai or something like that, but he's actually enclosed this economy of revelation in the sacred text so that it would be for the instruction of everyone future as their very own living and present word of God. So these are the initial basics of the literal and spiritual sense we want to continue on and give some illustrations of this and also divide up, respectively, the literal sense and then the spiritual sense. So we've covered the basics of literal and spiritual sense as genuses or as a more fundamental category, so to say. Now we want to take a step further and divide up literal sense into its two proper species and then uh, after some length of time, divide up the spiritual sense as well into its three species, uh, which we'll get to in a few moments. So first of all, the divisions of the literal sense, the divisions of the literal sense. Thomas goes on in the quotation that I read uh, far above, and again, I will supply it for you so you can refer to it. Thomas goes on. And he notes that, once again, in creatures, with us and among creatures, literal sense is twofold. Literal sense is twofold, or as he says, signification in words is twofold. We're going to spend quite some time considering this later. It's, in fact, 
in my opinion, everyone always gets all jazzed up about the spiritual senses and very exciting. And uh, yes, it's very exciting. But in my opinion, it's actually the species of the literal sense, which are proper and improper, which are more important, broadly speaking, for theology and for reading the sacred texts and even getting to the spiritual senses. Both are important, but I happen to think that uh, the two species of the literal sense, which have been lost for many, many centuries, are of more importance and of greater need for the church to recover today than even the spiritual senses, which have also been lost. So we'll spend quite some time considering this, but for now, note the example that Thomas uses in his text. And it is an example very popular in his day among grammarians and also expropriated by logicians. Example is of a man laughing versus a field or a meadow laughing. A man laughing, homo read it, versus a field or a meadow laughing. Pratum read it. Now, yes, I understand that a field laughing is not a meaningful utterance in English, but uh, we'll consider that in a moment. We do know what it means for a man to laugh. When I say that a man laughs, then this name laughs is going to be said of man properly, properly. In fact, traditionally in philosophy, risibility or capacity to laugh is a certain proprium or property or distinctive mark of man, which distinguishes man from all others. Man is a laughing thing. Laughter distinguishes him from all other animals and also from angels. Laughter is man's proper mark. And so we say a man laughs. This name laughs is said of man properly. And we can take this name laughs and also say it of other subjects. But when we do, it's going to be true of these other subjects only improperly and dependently on how it's said of man himself. When we say to laugh of other things, it's going to be said of them improperly and dependently on how it's said of man himself. For example, I can say that a field or a meadow laughs. And again, this is not really a meaningful phrase for us in English, but in Latin, and especially in the grammatical and logical tradition of Thomas Aquinas, this was a metaphorical name for Speaking of how a field flowers or blooms, flowers or blooms. And in fact, it was used as a technical philosophical example, similar to how a man laughs is a very precise, philosophically defined, very technical example that we often use as an analogy for lots of different work in order to uh, be very, very precise. This is why Thomas uses, in fact, this example of a man laughing and a field laughing again, even though for us today, the idea of a field laughing strikes us as rather strange. But thinking as Thomas does, uh, we would say that just as laughing is the natural overflow of what man is, in a similar way, Flowering or blooming is the natural overflow of what a field or what a meadow is. And so we can use the name laughs, not only of a man, but also of a meadow or field, because it communicates that something proper or distinctive of them is emerging as their proper mark. So we say not only that a man laughs, but also by analogy of proper proportionality that a field laughs.
A roughly similar example would be saying that a man laughs versus a hyena laughs. We use this example more easily in English today. And we can use that to somewhat get at what Thomas is going on about here, even though this example, which is more transparent in English, doesn't altogether reflect the precise logical and metaphysical intentions that Thomas has when he uses this example. We at least understand hyena is said to laugh because the sound he makes is similar to man laughter, is similar to man laughter. And therefore, the sense of a, uh, a hyena's laughter is understood and known to be true dependently upon man and said improperly of a hyena. Similarly, a field laughs. It's uh, almost an interesting factoid that uh, it's such a dead metaphor for us today that we have to go the mental route of comparing and contrasting and noting how it's an analogy of proper proportionality. A man blooms in his proper being by emitting laughter, and similarly, a field blooms into being by, by giving forth flowers. We have to go that mental route even to understand commonly what it even means to say a field laughs. That's actually kind of the point. Actually kind of the point. When we use names improperly or dependently, even if we've done that little mental route before such that we can do it immediately and transparently, like when we do when we say a hyena laughs, we immediately and intuitively know what that means. But we know what that means or what the sense is because at some point we've reflected on the relationship between a man and a hyena. And then more deeply, metaphysically or ontologically, there is a dependence relationship. And that's what Thomas Aquinas wants to advert our attention to when he divides literal sense into two proper and improper. So once again, we'll cover these things later, but these two examples pertain to these two species of literal sense, saying something properly that a man laughs, we call this proper literal sense. Whereas saying something improperly that a field laughs, we call improper literal sense. We could use another example from theology. For example, when I say that God knows, then this is speaking properly and so the signification is proper and the sense is proper literal. Whereas when I say that God is angry, then this is speaking improperly because God does not have wrath, but rather some created effect makes him to be similar to an angry man through analogy of proper proportionality. This then, saying that God is angry, is speaking improperly, and so the signification is improper, and the sense is improper literal. Improper literal. Knowledge versus anger are not said the same way in Duenas, as Thomas Aquinas notes in many places. And in fact, this is the example, the typical example he uses to illustrate this principle in theology more broadly. And because knowledge and anger are not said the same way of God, therefore, when it's written in the sacred text, their senses are not the same. Their senses are not the same, not only in the sacred text, but even in any text, which is speaking truthfully. God has knowledge versus God is angry, one sense is literal proper or proper literal, the other sense is improper literal, improper literal. So in creatures, literal sense is twofold. Similarly, in Duenas, Thomas says, both these species of literal sense are found in Holy Scripture. 
found in Holy Scripture. And again, we call them proper literal and improper literal sense, respectively. And indeed, even though there are many, many other species of literal sense, we talk about the historical, the etiological, the analogical, and many, many others. Thomas talks about this in ST1Q1A10, for example, many, many other species of literal sense, even though, nonetheless, they all reduce to this twofold division of proper and improper. They all reduce to this twofold division of proper and improper. This twofold division adequately divides the entirety of the literal sense. And for this reason, every other species of literal sense somehow reduces to either being proper literal or improper literal. What are some examples of these two species of literal sense in Holy Scripture? What are some examples? Well, here are three examples. And again, we're going to be spending many lectures covering each one of these, how they work, what we do with them, kinds of negations and things of that sort that we have to read. Also, the fact that not only is there improper literal sense set of God, but all the things of Christian mystery, they're often communicated in Holy Scripture improperly. We're going to spend a lot of time, but nonetheless, here are three quick examples to further give you some inkling into what's going on here. Number one, when it's written that God is love, then the sense is proper because Love is said of God without some negation pertaining to what love itself is. Whereas when it's written that he has a hand, then the sense is improper because hand is said of God with some negation, removing certain aspects of imperfection or limitation pertaining to what hand is, for example, corporeality. Second example, again, is summarized in the Creed, which is Thomas's example here. When it's written that the Son ascends, that he goes up, that he ascends, then the sense is proper, similar to how we say that a man laughs. Because when the Son ascends, ascending is in him, in the same way that ascending is in some man when he moves from lower to higher. Whereas when it's written that the son sits at the right hand of God, then the sense is improper. Then the sense is improper. The son ascends. It's proper. The son sits at the right hand of God is improper similar to how we say that a field laughs or that a hyena laughs, we might say. Why is this? Well, it's because although sitting, absolutely speaking, could indeed be in the sun according to human nature, nonetheless, God does not have a hand. And hence the sense cannot be proper. Even though sitting, absolutely speaking, could be in the sun according to human nature properly. Nonetheless, God does not have a hand. And thus, when it's said that the sun sits at the right hand of God, the sense as a whole cannot be proper. And for this reason, this text of Holy Scripture is said similar to how something sitting at a man's right hand is said with us and among creatures, namely, because he has favor and honor. And therefore, the sense of this text and similar is that the Son has favor and honor from God the Father. Again, third example, using Thomas's example elsewhere in ST1Q1A10 add three. When it's written that God has an arm versus that he has power, 
then the senses are improper and proper respectively because God is said to have an arm because he has power to act and therefore is similar to a man who has an arm. Now we call this second species of literal sense, we call it improper literal sense. But in tradition, also in Thomas Aquinas, it goes by many names. It goes by many names. And in point of fact, perhaps even more than the spiritual sense, the improper literal sense is unbelievably confused today and in the last many centuries, simply because of the many ways it's called in the tradition. For example, it's often called the metaphorical sense. Sometimes it's called the allegorical sense, even though also the spiritual sense is called metaphorical and allegorical. Again, lots of equivocation in the tradition. You really have to be very careful. Sometimes it's called parabolic sense, which is uh, the way a certain objector in Thomas's ST1 Q10, uh, Q, Q1 A10, he calls it the parabolic sense. And Thomas picks up this name, conventional sign used in his day and says, yes, 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 parabolic sense falls under the literal, namely as its genus. It is among the improper literal sense for various reasons we can consider at a certain point in the future. Sometimes it's called as a whole parabolic sense, even though sometimes only the certain literal sense, which is proper to Christ's parables in the gospels and other parables, and other parts of scripture. Sometimes only that sense is called parabolic literal. Once again here, lots of confusion in the tradition. You just have to keep your head square. Be very careful with the names of the senses. Because oftentimes, especially among the fathers, uh, you know, they're calling 50 different things all by the same name. Or they're using 50 different names all for the same thing. And uh, a lot of trouble happens trying to sort this out. We call it improper literal sense. And we do so for two reasons among many others. One is that because names for both the species of the literal sense and the species of the spiritual sense, which we cover in, in, in a moment, the names for the species are all going to be somehow taken from the things signified rather than from, for example, how the letters themselves signify. So um, other ways of naming improper literal sense uh, would be considering what the letters are which are, pertain to this improper literal sense. And because these letters are called metaphors by grammarians, hence certain people call it the metaphorical literal sense because the letters are called metaphors. We call it improper literal because all the names for the species are taken from considering the things signified. And the fact that the predicates of the improper literal sense are in the subject somehow with negation or somehow via analogy of proper proportionality means that we're taking name from things signified and therefore we call it improper. We'll talk about this quite a lot more in the future. The second reason, though, and this is perhaps even more important, is that the improper literal sense parallels, if you were listening closely, parallels saying something of God improperly in theology. So in the technicalities of theology proper, we develop very careful and refined ways of speaking about God. And one of those prominent ways is called speaking improperly about God. Well, the letters that deal with improper speech about God, we, we, we say that they generate the improper literal sense for just that reason, because it's connected, it's parallel. These are not the same thing, improperly saying something of God versus improper literal sense, but they are dealing with the same situations, we might say. And so we name them similarly to remember and to help us for those of you who have experience in the technicalities of theological science you know 
that when we say that God reasons or God laughs and others of this sort, we're speaking improperly. When we say that God is a rock, a lion, and others of this sort, we're speaking improperly. And therefore, you're going to have a leg up when we turn to the letters of Holy Scripture and we speak of improper literal sense. Because you kind of already know, roughly speaking, how this is going to go. And that's why we call it improper literal. Now, outside the historical books of Holy Scripture, where the majority sense is going to be proper literal and then spiritual sense, because salvation history itself as a whole and among its parts is significant. All of these deeds and doings of God making known the holy mysteries of the faith. Proper literal spiritual sense in historical books are going to be the majority senses we're dealing with. Outside of that, the improper literal sense is the majority sense among all kinds of the literal sense. Outside the historical books and books that are similar, the improper literal sense is the majority of everything that falls under the literal. Most frequent throughout Holy Scripture, as Thomas Aquinas notes, for example, in ST1, Q1A9, where he considers whether Holy Scripture has due usage of metaphors, which is really another question for if it's fitting or do, if it's fitting, convenient, uh, that we have improper literal sense found in Holy Scripture, and in fact, so frequently found in Holy Scripture. Is this fitting? Is this reasonable? As Thomas notes in his explanation, his twofold explanation, why it is indeed fitting, and in fact, most fitting that the vast majority of the letters of Holy Scripture are generating improper literal sense. He notes that this sense abounds and it even fittingly abounds for two reasons. He says, God so mercifully condescended and spoke and fittingly both one to how human persons know generally, that is to say from sense, and two to how general human persons know, namely both wise and the unwise both the learned of the world and the un unlearned, both the mighty and the weak, both the strong and the simple. God speaks not only to human persons, how they know generally, but also to general human persons. And for this reason, he's characterized or coded his revelation, chiefly contained in Holy Scripture, in such a fashion that it is meet or due to what we are and who we are and how we know. And therefore, because improper literal sense is most fitting for us and for our salvation as material knowers who are brought to know the immaterial and indeed supernatural order by way of sense. And indeed, because this usage is most concordant with the utter richness and lavishness of God's mercy, hence it's happened. So many letters in Holy Scripture are symbols and metaphors of supernatural mysteries, and the sense in these symbolic and metaphorical letters is improper literal sense. God in Holy Scripture is very infrequently compared to the transcendentals, and most frequently compared to material things like rocks and lions and others of this sort. God in Holy Scripture is most frequently compared to a man in human realities because, Thomas says, divine things are best considered, quote, from those things which are of human things, human affairs, human realities, as he says in ST1, Q8, A3, Respondeo. Or as Domingo Banez says quite well, also, quote, supernatural mysteries exceed the capacity of our intellect due to their height. And therefore, 
we cannot know supernatural and divine realities according to their mode, but rather these things are to be proposed to us according to our mode in relation to material things, end quote. It is to say, the things of God are too high beyond our reach. And so God, in his mercy, has come down very low and within our immediate grasp to raise us up to him. So that's the division of the literal sense of Holy Scripture. Now we want to turn and consider the division of the spiritual sense. Just briefly here, in its general remarks, we're going to spend many lectures demonstrating that these things are so very, very important to carefully go about this. The spiritual senses are not just willy-nilly. It's not just conjuring things out of the air. It's not a free-for-all. Spiritual sense is an extremely technical discipline, extremely technical discipline, with the most extreme high bars of probity, with sharply defined limits of its usage and purpose in theological science. It's, for example, never used to demonstrate anything of theology. It's only used for illustration or explanation. Uh, you can't demonstrate anything of Christian doctrine except from the literal sense of Holy Scripture. Never do we demonstrate anything of doctrine from the spiritual sense and many other things that we'll say. I'll spend a lot of time covering these matters. Uh, also, what spiritual senses are in their triple division. But here, we want to just introduce them and uh, get a hold of them, briefly speaking. So considering spiritual sense as found in Holy Scripture. Throughout the tradition, the task has always been to adequately define what we find, to adequately divide what we actually find in the text. We approach the doctrine. This is something I was mentioning early in the lecture. We're not interested in conjuring up what we imagine might be nice, what sense is in letters generally, or of course, there's no spiritual sense in any other letters except Holy Scripture, but you know something that we might find in other letters outside the canon. But nonetheless, when we come to adequately divide it, the goal has been to adequately divide what we really find and subsume there under, under these adequate divisions all the spiritual senses that are concretely found enclosed in the text, enclosed in the letter. And again, I remind you how we say spiritual senses in the letter. It's in the letter because the realities which signify outside and beyond and before the letter themselves signify other realities and the significant realities have been enclosed in the text because they are the object or themselves the thing signified by the text. And therefore, they are in the text and the things that they signify are also in the text. The goal, I say, has always been to subsume under our divisions of the spiritual sense every possible spiritual sense you're going to concretely find in the sacred text. To adequately divide this. Just as... Aristotle's 10 categories adequately divide ens creatum and subsume it thereunder, whereupon these 10 categories themselves are the aspects of created ends and therefore can be used to understand all things. This theological task has proven difficult and many divisions have been proposed and been better or worse, depending on how adequately they divide this global reality, this global reality of all the things that signify. And eventually, 
after much refinement, especially during Thomas's time and immediately before, also worked on by Thomas himself, eventually an adequate threefold division was found making three species of spiritual sense, three species of spiritual sense. Now, these three species have many names. And if you thought you were confused before, let me promise you, you will be even more confused when you go spelunking in the tradition and try to encounter all the names that theologians use, have used various traditions, the Greek tradition, the Latin tradition, not to mention the fact that they are often proposing different divisions, as I just mentioned. It took a very, very long time to come up with an adequate division that got everything, the global reality. Uh, so not only are there you know, probably 15, 20 or so different common names for roughly the same sorts of things, but they're also different ways of slicing up the pie. Very confusing. Many names. So many, many have been confused, especially today. It, it is quite shocking how many are confused today on these points. Also adding to the confusion is the fact, this is where it gets very exciting, the fact that many of the names of these species of the spiritual sense have been co-opted from names used for the literal sense or its two species. Ah, it's just absolute chaos. Despite this, the most popular names used are allegorical, anagogical, and moral. Allegorical, anagogical, and moral, often called tropological. Often called tropological. Allegorical, anagogical, moral, tropological. These names signify the actual aspects of these three adequate divisions as reduced from all spiritual senses found in Holy Scripture. These three names signify the aspects of these three adequate divisions as they're reduced from the spiritual senses found in Holy Scripture, similar to how the names quantity, quality, and so on signify Aristotle's 10 categories as they're harvested from reality. And after these three species of the spiritual sense were made, then these three names, allegorical, anagogical, and moral, were adapted to signify these three things because their primary or generally conventional signification somehow was fitting to the actual things we're trying to talk about here, these actual species. And therefore, it was more or less perspicuous as to the intentions of these names. So for example, because moral sense pertains to things to be done, hence it was named moral because morals are things to be done. This name moral has that kind of range in usage and therefore we stick it to this uh, you know, the important thing are these aspects. The names are important so that we can get at these aspects. Moral and moral, because of uh, what the moral sense is, the name moral was used because it's more or less fitting. Similarly, anagogical pertains to those things which are to be hoped for. And so we used this name anagogical, which means to lead upward, because the things hoped for raise our spirits and things future are beyond us and things heavenly are above us. So we use this name because it's transparently helpful to what the thing is that we're trying to get at, this second species of spiritual sense. Nonetheless, no doubt better names could and can be found. For example, Allegorical, as a species of spiritual sense, allegorical is a highly equivocal name, <laughs> has been used for many other senses besides this allegorical species of the spiritual sense. Um, quite honestly, 
allegorical sense probably refers to six or seven main different things in Christian history, the doctrine of the sense of Holy Scripture. It's ridiculous. Probably most frequently, the name allegorical sense is used to signify, one, either the genus of spiritual sense itself, namely sense taken from signification and realities, two, the species of improper literal sense, yeah, or three, the species of the spiritual sense. So all these three are called allegorical, and all these three are vastly different from each other. Its usage, especially for the species of spiritual sense pertaining to things to be believed, has generated much confusion, much, much confusion and many headaches for students. Nonetheless, with those uh, kind of qualifications and complaints aside, nonetheless, these names were accepted and are to be accepted according to theological convention. This is the most popular way of talking, and therefore we have to use it. And uh, a word of encouragement, it does get easier. Uh, you do uh, adapt yourself to these uh, highly pinpointed usage of words and, uh, and are also enabled to roll with the punches of various fathers who are using words radically different, different from us, different from themselves, different from the medievals, and so on. In Thomas's day, there's just absolutely dozens, dozens of different words, also dozens of different senses. And it is uh, a testimony to Thomas's genius, the fact that he's able to, with help, of course, but he's able to adequately divide all of everything, the whole doctrine of the senses of Holy Scripture, and then to elect names which are more or less useful and which more or less stuck, at least throughout the Thomas tradition, through the Roman Catholic tradition, and not so much the Protestant tradition for, very, for various reasons that we can uh, talk about another time. But nonetheless, for now, with those kind of ground clearing remarks aside, for now, we can consider what these three species of spiritual sense are as pertaining to faith, hope, and love, respectively. So we're going to take quite a lot of time at slightly adjusting the definition. I'm not really going to give you a definition here. These three species roughly pertain to faith, hope, and love. Later, we'll circle back around and we'll actually define what they are. And we'll talk a lot about how various definitions more or less hit the mark and things like that. But for now, just to give you a reference point or a handhold, think of them as corresponding respectively to faith, hope, and love, and you'll be perfectly fine. You'll be perfectly fine for rough work. So faith, hope, and love, allegorical, anagogical, moral, faith, hope, and love. Some remarks on each of these and some examples. In allegorical spiritual sense, its realities are things to be believed, things to be believed. Our allegorical spiritual sense pertains to faith. For example, when it's written that not one of his bones is to be broken, then in this letter, spiritual sense is because the realities themselves signify. Not the words, the words also signify. But the things, the very unbroken bones there themselves. And this spiritual sense reduces to allegorical sense because the unbroken bones as a reality signify the unbroken Christ, as is said in John 19.36. So, it's spiritual sense because the sense is taken from signification realities. It reduces to this species of spiritual sense, namely allegorical, because the unbroken bones signify the unbroken Christ, and the unbroken Christ in his unbrokenness on the cross 
uh, is something to be believed. Whereas in anagogical spiritual sense, realities signified are things to be hoped for, things to be hoped for. Anagogical sense pertains to hope. For example, when it's written of the tabernacle of Moses, therein is spiritual sense. Not because letters themselves signify the heavenly mansions of Christ, but rather because the tabernacle of Moses signifies thereof, as is said in Hebrews 8.5. And because these heavenly mansions of Christ are things to be hoped for, hence this spiritual sense reduces to anagogical, anagogical, which again is a word which means leading upward, leading upward, things that are beyond us, things which are future, things which are in heaven, something of that sort. Finally, third, in moral or tropological sense, Realities signified are things to be loved. Things to be loved or addressed to the will and somehow done. For example, when it's written that Moses lifted up the serpent, spiritual sense is found in the letter because this lifting up itself, also signified by the letter, itself signifies yet another thing. And it reduces to moral sense because we're being commanded to look upon Christ crucified under the form of a serpent, just as they were to look upon the serpent hung upon the stake for healing. And indeed, when they were healed because they looked, then this reduces to anagogical sense because we too are healed and also will be healed in the future when we look upon Christ. And yes, also something of this reduces to allegorical sense as well, because the serpent himself signifies Christ. For it is said in John 3.14, as the verse is well known, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whosoever believes upon him will not perish, but have eternal life. So in summary, sense in Holy Scripture is divided into two. Literal, taken from signification in letters, and spiritual, taken from signification in realities. The literal sense is divided into two proper, where the predicate is in the subject properly speaking, improper, where the predicate is in subject somehow improperly, either because there's a negation in order for truth or analogy of proper proportionality. The spiritual sense can be divided into three, allegorical, where the reality is signified pertains to things to be believed, anagogical, where the reality signified pertains to things to be hoped for, and moral, where the reality signified pertain to things to be done. Thomas, in the quotation we read far above, uh, concludes his brief explanation, which we've just expounded here the last many minutes, he concludes it with an extended example, which renders concrete, so to say, the abstract doctrine and uh, serves as a particular in order that we can abstract the universal. This is something very important to Thomas. One of the things that we do for students is set before their minds fitting examples so that they can behold in that example, the universal aspect we're talking about and eventually abstract more and more to the apprehension of the universal. This is very, very important. And uh, apprehending the universal itself, in this case, the doctrine of the sense as a Holy Scripture, 
adequately compassed as we've just done, apprehending that universal requires more and more particular examples. And you have to focus in on those examples and allow the mind to do its abstracting work for quite some time until not only can you recite the doctrine, senses divide into two, literal and spiritual, literal into two, proper and improper, spiritual into three, allegorical, pedagogical, moral. Not only can you define each one of these, but that is alive to you in your intellect as a certain ratio or explanation, as Thomas would say, just as the 10 categories, again, of Aristotle abstracted from ends creatum in its universal aspect, the material order, taken up into the mind, refined and chopped down into its reduced categories, becomes alive to the philosopher and therefore is useful for the actual doing of philosophy. Similarly, at this stage, you're just hearing the doctrine for the first time or becoming more familiar with it until you achieve to the universal. It's going to always feel like walking in Saul's armor. And uh, you just have to give yourself some time in order to assimilate your mind there too. It, it happens. Uh, it happens. Uh, I can attest. It uh, happens over time and it does happen. And Thomas here, as I say, closes with an extended example which he intends as an initial reference point. It's a very carefully crafted example. He directs us to Genesis and indeed the opening of Holy Scripture itself, let there be light. It's clear that he's speaking significantly and with weighted words. Um, there's a bit of a wink going on here. Let there be light is, is not an example chosen at random to say the least. The obvious overtones to intellectual light, to natural and supernatural light, and things like this make clear that his intention is to use this as exemplary for the whole of God's creation and the whole of Holy Scripture. This is an exemplary example. And we can't explain it fully here, but we want to note the broad strokes. For Thomas, these letters, let there be light, signify a certain reality, namely the very making of light to be, or the act of creation, giving being. And this, of course, reduces to the genus of the literal sense. Whereas that very reality itself, the act of creation, has also been made by God to be significant of still other realities. The first, allegorically, is the reality of the missions of Christ. Christ is born in the church, Thomas says. The second, anagogically, is the reality which is the end or the term of his missions. Quote, through Christ, we are introduced to glory. This is the final cause of incarnation. And third, morally, is the reality which is the means of achieving that end, namely faith, charity, which erupt in us from grace. Quote, through Christ, we are illumined and inflamed in intellect and will. God, when he created, made even his first effect significant of these things, and all this is enclosed in that letter of Genesis, let there be light. Now again, Thomas's concrete example here is obviously highly charged. It's taken from the headwaters of creation, because for Thomas, God's deeds and doings are significant realities from here and onward. All creation itself is made significant. And uh, note, by the way, that this is not the same, but rather in addition to the natural signification in all of God's effects, where just as smoke signifies fire, similarly, every effect is somehow similar to its prior cause. Because it participates something similar to God, every creature 
is said to signify him just as smoke signifies fire and therefore it bequeaths divine knowledge. That's in addition to what we're talking about here when we say that all of God's deeds and doing, indeed all of creation itself, is made significant over and above that natural similitude proper to all things insofar as they are effects and therefore similar to God himself, wherein whose similitude they participate. So this example is taken from the headwaters of creation, is taken from the headwaters of Holy Scripture, because for Thomas, these senses pervade Holy Scripture from its beginning unto its end. And Holy Scripture, once again, encloses creation within its folds and englobes within its womb, especially salvation history, notably God's deeds and doings in Israel, and most especially the actions and passions of Christ. And Thomas's example pertains to Christ, who for him, not only in his eternal generation, not only in his temporal generation, but even in his invisible missions. And in fact, the whole supernatural order embraced in Christ, all of this is signified. Christ for Thomas is the beginning and end of all and the very center of all of scripture. And for this reason is even uniquely signified by all realities before him and all realities after and all the letters of the text throughout. Thomas says this in various places, but perhaps most acutely, it's actually one of my personal favorite passages of Thomas, is where in his John commentary, he gives the spiritual sense of Christ's parade into Jerusalem, this triumphal entry, as it's often called. Thomas gives its spiritual sense where Christ is surrounded before and behind by all praising him. You have this image, this thing, this historical fact, this reality of Christ in the center, proceeding onto the cross, and crowds before and crowds behind are all praising him. This is meaningful. This is significant. This is, in God's providence, has been made a sign Christ, Thomas says, is the very center or the middle of all the deeds in the Old and New Testament times. And in order to signify that, in order to teach us that so that we can understand and have that truth more deeply in our soul, God has, quote, made the crowds to praise him just as much the crowd which was preceding him and just so much the crowd which is following him, they're showering praises upon Christ. All of this is a sign that the things before, the things after, and all the letters which detail the whole, all of this is enclosed in Christ. All else is a speech of Christ, Christ himself, a speech of God. So those are the basics of this doctrine. And drawing toward conclusion here, we want to underline Thomas's intention when he actually adverts us to this explanation at all, as he gives his comments in the Galatians 4 commentary, he pauses and he gives the things that we've just expound in Nuche. Because we, we want to consider this here just a few minutes of conclusion, because Thomas's intention manifests the intention or the final cause of this doctrine of the sense of Holy Scripture. What is the point? What is the final cause? What is the purpose? Well, Thomas's reason for mentioning the senses here in his Galatians commentary manifests this final cause. And it also shows us how we have to know and habituate this doctrine to obtain that end or final cause. So what purpose does Thomas pause his commentary? Why on earth must he review the basics of this entire doctrine? Well, it's because the sense in this Galatian letter is very hard to apprehend. 
And we're helped to know and have habitual this doctrine of the senses of scripture. So the Galatian letter is very hard as a help to this task. It's good to know and even have habitual the doctrine of the senses of scripture. Galatians 4, as you know, is famous for its difficulty and also as an example of the allegorical spiritual sense. Indeed, it's in the tradition used very frequently as a demonstration. We will cover the Galatians 4 text in a uh, subsequent lecture. And uh, because it's both an example and a place for demonstration, it's used in tradition as something of a locus classicus, both to actually demonstrate the spiritual sense as a genus and to exemplify the allegorical spiritual sense as its species. It's a very famous text. Yeah? Paul is giving some understanding of the mystery of grace. God has made it to be that both Peter and Paul are significant realities, each signifying motherhood of the church in its respective economies. From Peter's womb would have been begotten children who revert to slavery, and for this reason, Paul withstands him to his face. You remember the famous confrontation in Jerusalem? But from Paul's womb, straining, as he says, in the pains of childbirth until Christ is fully formed, are being begotten children who indeed are free, but who nonetheless are being deceived and themselves starting to forget that they are no longer slaves, but sons and as sons, heirs, and so on. Similarly, Paul says, not only are Peter and Paul significant realities in the providence of God, this has happened, and this has been made a sign for the church so that we would greater understand the mystery of grace as it unfolds through time in his two economies. Similarly, Paul says, also Old Testament realities themselves were made by God to be significant. Abraham is God, his sons, his seed and offspring. Hagar, just as Peter himself was becoming enslaved again and of the uncircumcised, not of flesh, but of heart, Hagar, because she was born a slave, was fitting to signify that mode, how God handled his underage heirs as in former times. And not only was she fitting for this, not only is she similar to this, but she's actually made to be a sign thereof and her son a sign thereof. Whereas Sarah, as Paul himself, became free from the law, because she herself was born free, and so would beget a son who was altogether free and heir of Abraham. Sarah is fitting to signify that way that God handles his children when the time had fully come and we had received adoption unto sons. And indeed, once again, not only is she similar to this, but she's actually made to be a sign. This is always very important to understand Signification runs along the lines of similarity is not identical to the similarity. Sarah is similar, yes, indeed, but the similarity is not where we're taking the sense from. That would be just to use Sarah as an illustration. No, Sarah is an actual sign. Sarah is an actually significant reality. And from that significant reality, we take sense. We are alerted to the presence of that sense from the similitude, but it's not identical to it. These are things we'll talk about at a future time. Sarah is made significant. These realities in the Old Testament time, themselves signified in the Old Testament letters, Paul says, were indeed allegories. Allegories, not allegory, which is improper literal sense, but allegory, which is spiritual sense, namely its genus, which in this case just so happens to reduce to that species of spiritual sense later also happening to be called by theologians allegorical. All this again, we'll consider at length, Galatians 4. But we can simply quote for now from Augustine in his De Trinitate, where 
he notes this clearly, and this is something universally agreed upon by all the fathers and medievals. Quote from Augustine, quote, where the apostle has said allegory, that is to say, when the apostle Paul writes allegory, here, quote, he does not mean allegory in the words, but in the reality, because he's demonstrated that the two testaments are to be understood from the two sons of Abraham, the one from a slave, the other from a free, which is not something said generating literal sense from signification in letters, but rather is something done, something real, something reified, a thing generating spiritual sense because it's taken from signification proper to realities. All this is really rather hard to apprehend. Much confusion is found in history, even more confusion found today. Thomas in order to give us this sense, reminds us of the doctrine of the senses of Holy Scripture organically derived from its universe and therefore useful as a means of interpreting whatsoever letter, also the Galatians 4. Just as Aristotle's 10 categories, organically harvested and defined after much labor, are taken from the universe of created ends as its adequate reduction, and so can be used to apprehend whatsoever reality you can ever find in a similar way. This doctrine is taken up from the universe of Holy Scripture. It is its adequate reduction. And therefore, it's useful to turn about and actually engage in interpretation. And this is where we find the principal final cause of this doctrine. What is the point? It is to interpret Holy Scripture. This doctrine, as a whole and in its parts, is principally for this purpose, that we actually interpret Holy Scripture and apprehend whatsoever sense, howsoever in its letter. This is the task and the goal of all Catholic interpretation. It is apprehending whatsoever sense, howsoever in Holy Scripture in its global respect. This doctrine, then, is the grid or the slots or the checklist of everything you do and will achieve in that task, all here refined with proper methods and procedures developed for each sense so that you can actually execute this task well. This is why Thomas reminds us of it. Immediately when he encounters a mystery of grace in his Galatians commentary, and also this is why he determines it and places it as the very last article in his Summa before beginning theology, before encountering the proper object of Sacra Doctrina, God and all of God. And that brings us here in closing to the need we have to habituate this doctrine to obtain that end. Really the reason why we study this doctrine carefully. Understanding this doctrine is nothing else except forging in your intellect these aspects found in Holy Scripture as its proper categories. And then when you have actually forged them in your intellect, you take them and you become more and more habituated to them and possessed by them, so that whensoever we encounter the sacred text, these habits are lights within ourselves. These senses must become habits, and habits in the technical sense, habits, imperfect acts, here in the intellect, which constitute uh, being well-disposed or outfitted for the actual performance of interpretation. Habits, as you know, in the technical sense, the metaphysical sense, are like compressed springs. The dynamic tension orients and pressures their owner in the right way if they're virtues, or the wrong way if they're vices. Studying this doctrine demands of us that we make these habits. It demands of us much indeed. It is the assignment of 
to become outfitted adequately for whatever interpretive task the theologian will engage. In short, it is to become a virtuoso interpreter, or as it was once called, master of the sacred page. And with that, we conclude this lecture. I hope that it has been profitable for you and uh, look forward to continue to walk through this in the future with you.